Welcome everyone to AAF Toledo's Lunch and Learn program. We have a record-breaking registration for our webinar today. I'm so excited. Um, I am Sue Bruning. I'm a member of the Board of Governors for AAF Toledo and Chair of the Program Committee. And uh, like I said, we have an incredible program lined up today, so I'm going to get through the logistics and uh, turn it over to our experts. Uh, so we do have all audience members uh, should be muted. Uh, if you're not muted, uh, please take a minute to do that. Um, cameras should be turned off to eliminate any distraction uh, for our panelists. And first, we're going to start with a few words from Melinda with Promo Hits, who is a generous sponsor of our AAF Toledo programming. Melinda? Okay, thank you very much, Sue. I appreciate it. I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about a service that we have been offering for a while, but don't really talk about very often. Um, we've been doing a little bit more of it lately with a lot of people working from home. We're doing more fulfillment for companies. So here are two projects that we have done recently for some of our customers. Um, I think you can see here that this box we were able to customize with a logo on um, the sides. And then we sent this box out to their list. And so it has a little note in here from them. And then we also had PPE items, which is what they wanted to send. We have a hand sanitizer, a mask lanyard, um, a no touch tool, and then also a mask. And so we sent those out across the United States and into Canada for that client. Um, the next client um, is more local and they wanted something um, to send out to their employees because they've been really working very hard. They're a healthcare company. And so they wanted to say thank you for all their hard work. So we curated a box for them, um, which included a note card that said, you know, thank you very much. And then we also have two um, insulated wine glasses for them, a bamboo cutting board, and then they wanted to also add a sausage, a cheese, and crackers. And knowing this company, um, they really like to support local businesses. So we offered them two options. One was being able to find the sausage, the cheese, and the crackers to one of our regular promotional product suppliers, or we could offer it to them by purchasing from a local company here in Bluffton. They absolutely love that idea, even though it costs a little bit more to do that. So we were able to buy locally these three items and those items actually were made here in Ohio. So um, just a couple of things that we can offer to you if you're looking to do something. Um, this particular box, they even ask us to get blue and green, um, crinkle in and mix it up and use that so that those are their company colors so that we could really personalize it in that way as well too. So if you or your company need some help in something like this, please give us a call at Promo Hits. My information is in the, um, uh, <laughs> the members list. <laughs> yeah, and we have it in the email uh, that went out uh, to as the invitation for this event. And uh, we do keep promo hits in most of our communications. I think you'll even find it on the events page of our website. Um, so we'll make it easy for, for all of you to connect with Melinda. Thank so, you. Thank you, Melinda. And I think, you know, whether we're talking about B2C or B2B marketing, this personalized experience is really a modern marketing approach that has demonstrated ROI across the board. So if you're looking to personalize experience uh, for your target audience, Melinda is there to help you out. Thanks. All right, so um, the silver medal panel is an annual tradition here at AAF. It's one of our most popular programs. Um, the AAF Silver Medal Award celebrates men and women who have made outstanding contributions to advertising and who have made active, uh, who have been active in furthering the industry's standards, creative excellence, and responsibilities in the area of social concern. So today's panel is comprised of three silver medal award winners. And this is really our opportunity to um, hear their stories and their insights. They're amazing advertisers and marketers. So please take advantage, pick their creative minds today. 
Um, so our panelists are um, Bill Sattler. Bill is a founding partner and interactive print creative director at Madhouse. Bill graduated from Kent State University with a degree in visual communication design and has expanded his capabilities beyond a traditional print and illustration background. Raised and ingrained with an entrepreneurial blue collar work ethic, Bill appreciates a hard day's work and the satisfaction it brings when a project comes to life. I think most of us do. Uh, results driven, not process obsessed, push the boundaries of traditional design and get it done on time and on budget. That's Bill's mantra and something he tries to impart on all of his team members. Joining Bill is Judy McFarlane. Judy serves as president and CEO of Thread Inc., a multifaceted business consortium. She brings the insights of a diverse career as corporate executive, client, consultant, and business owner to each challenge. As a corporate executive with more than 30 years of experience in strategic marketing communications, branding, content marketing, digital advertising, and public relations. Judy's been instrumental in successful branding and ad campaigns for organizations like the Henry Ford Health System, McLaren St. Luke's Hospital, the Toledo Clinic, and Toledo Jeep Fest. Judy is very active in the local community, serving on boards and actively supporting a whole host of nonprofit um, organizations. And uh, finally, wrapping it up, um, Mark Ryder is owner in level two of Level 2 Audio. Throughout a professional career spanning more than 30 years, Mark has earned the distinction of being a go-to resource for sound design, audio production and commercials, and voice recording and mixing for corporate videos and documentary projects. Mark has produced high impact audio and recorded vocal tracks for an impressive list of local and national groups, such as the LeBron James Family Foundation, Home Shopping Network, my alma mater, Bowling Green State University, a Ziggy Zumba, NPR, Libby Glass, Harpo Studios, and Owens, Illinois. So without further ado, that's a lot of accolades right there. Um, I'm going to turn it over um, to our panelists. So each will have an opportunity to share their stories and their insights, and then uh, we'll open it up to the audience uh, for Q&A. So uh, let's get started. Bill, do you want to uh, take the mic? Not really, but I will. All right, so I guess I'll jump right in. Um, 44 people uh, didn't think there was going to be more than five, but um, so um, as Sue said, I went to Kent State. Uh, I was interested in architecture from the very beginning and kind of realized quickly when I got to Kent for a tour that um, I wasn't really cut out for architecture. I didn't like math. I didn't like anything but the art part of it. So um, he got into graphic design, had no idea what graphic design was when I first started and then just really liked it. I did um, an internship at UT out of school in a marketing department. Um, I met um, my favorite person in the world there. And then I went to Communique, worked there for about six years. I learned a lot. Um, my very first project at Communique was a production art job for a senior designer. It was a, I don't know, like a 28 page brochure. And I was to get it ready to go to print. And um, back in the day when we made, this is like old people talking about back in the day stuff. Um, we used to make film, we used to, the printer used to make films of all the spreads and layouts. And then, and then we did match prints to check color and to proof. And uh, I sent the whole thing to the printer and uh, all the photos were in RGB, not CMYK. So my first, that was my first job out of the gate. And I had like two to $3,000 in, in pre-press fees that I was responsible for. So 
that was awesome. It was a really good learning experience. I don't know if Communique appreciated it as much as I did, but um, I always started Madhouse in, in 2004, uh, Rob Safer and Steve Mockenstern and I, and um, been doing that ever since. Uh, we've grown to about, uh, I think we're at uh, 12 people now. We've been up to 16 or 17 with some interns, but we stayed pretty small. We like, we kind of like that small feel and, um, you know, just keep an eye on our creative. It, it's, it's, uh, it's been a good fit for us. Um, the kind of projects that I like uh, just kind of revolve around collaboration. I like the projects like branding projects uh, or campaign projects that we can all get together. I love I love the critiques. Um, I love to hear like rationale from designers. Um, I'm a big fan of a good presentation. So, um, you know, the, the preparing for a presentation and, and being prepared for a client presentation is, is pretty important to me and pretty exciting to me. Um, we've worked on a bunch of really great projects with some really great clients it's hard to kind of pick out a few but those those branding projects are are pretty fun um worst projects i probably couldn't say here in front of 44 people so uh, i'm gonna maybe stay away from that we've had some very interesting meetings this is part of this is one of the most fun things about uh this job is meeting all sorts of people and all sorts of businesses and, and uh, learning what people do on a day to day. It's, it's pretty interesting. As far as inspiration, um, I'm inspired by architecture. Um, I'm inspired by interior design, all sorts of, uh, all sorts of design processes. I'm, I'm pretty inspired by. Uh, one thing that I do, take a lot of inspiration from and my wife constantly makes fun of me about this is cooking shows um i i watch cooking shows please don't judge um you know i watch all types of cooking shows but there's you know there's a few there's there's like chef's table on netflix there's there's a couple of home shows like on apple plus there's there's one called home i the the thing about uh, being inspired by these is um, uh, it's fascinating how similar the design process is from from chef to architect to interior designer to I mean it, it's texture it's color it's shape it's um, it, it's presentation it's hierarchy all the same things kind of apply and it's it's really fascinating to me to see how there's kind of a formula for each principle and um, you know, how, how that relates to what we do. I also think the, the really great artists um, are using their life stories and their life experiences. Um, and I think that's, that's a good key for us as we are, you know, move to graphic design. Um, I, I like my bio says, I don't really have a big process. I'm a super impatient person. Um, I've been, I've been um, told that I'm laid back, and again, my wife would say no on that. I am not laid back. I'm, I'm really impatient, and I like to get right into things. I'm not a sketcher. Uh, I don't sketch. Um, I wish I did. I, I love when people sketch and plan things out, and I, I just I admire that. I'm not a mood board person. Yet I love to use mood boards. I love the the research and the idea, all that. I'm, I'm a huge fan of that. We've got we've got people on our team that do these things, and I just really appreciate it. But I'm just not one of those people. I like to get right in to production. I like to see things happen really fast. Um, I, I do a lot of thinking when I'm not at my desk. Uh, a lot of conceptual thinking is is away from is kind of away from the office. Sometimes it's at home. Sometimes it's driving. Um, it could be any time, but 
but it kind of never stops as I would suppose all creative people are kind of uh, doing that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I went through most of my list. I think Judy, maybe you're up and I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Bill. That was awesome. I, I told Bill and Mark when we started, I feel a little uncomfortable doing this today, given what's going on in the country with the inauguration. I know this was pre-scheduled, but wow, what a what a big day for us. So thank you all for uh, joining us today and, and your interest in, in our stories. I do have it on on the screen next to me, so I'm trying not to be distracted. <laughs> But um, before I share my story, I, I just want to say I've worked with both Bill and Mark for many years, decades, in fact. And uh, if there's one thing you take away from today's presentation, that's that uh, their success is not just the result of being highly talented, which they both are. Uh, more so, I think it's the result of just being good human beings. Uh, they're both humble servant leaders who really care about others, who care about their teams, who care about their clients. And that's really what it's all about is we're here to work together to support one another um, so that others can find success. Obviously, predominantly our clients, but um, our, our team members as well. So I'm really, really honored to uh, share the stage with both these guys. So that said, um, my story, I'd like to uh, sum up my career with, with this one statement, and that is when you start out photographing dead people, your career can only improve from there. <laughs> and that's a true story, but, but let me back up. Uh, so uh, when I was a kid, my dream was not to become an ad executive. I'm not sure that's any, any kid's dream. Uh, if so, if there's anybody out there in the audience that knew you know, from when they were 10 years old, um, I want to be an ad exec, then I think we'd all love to hear your story because that would be fascinating. Um, instead, my dream was to become a veterinarian. Uh, I love animals, love working with animals. My, my very first job, in fact, when I was 14 years old was uh, cleaning out the dog kennels at our local veterinarian's office. So um, it was a bit taxing on the senses, I will admit, uh, but I, I truly loved the job. Uh, I soon realized, however, that my passion for animals far outweighed my ability to process the math and data uh, behind veterinary medicine. Uh, left brain thinking is not my strength either. So uh, off I went to college, Bowling Green, uh, with an undeclared major. Uh, I tried psychology, I tried fine art, which was a complete disaster, uh, a few other majors until I discovered the VCT program and realized that my niche was being a producer, being on the production side of the business. So I graduated with a specialization in photography and landed my first job at uh, Channel 13 WTVG as a photo assistant. Uh, from there, I got a job as a photographer at Prometica Toledo Hospital. Hence photographing dead people. So I was able to bring this around. <laughs> uh, so part of my job was uh, medical documentation. So I had to photograph the worst of the worst or the most unusual cases. And that included autopsies, a lot of autopsies. Uh, one time I even had to photograph a uh, body that had been exhumed from the grave after, after being there for a year uh, for a medical malpractice case. Um, I did a lot of uh, accident victims in the ER, um, rape cases, child abuse cases, those were really tough, um, as well as documenting surgical procedures where uh, they were removing objects that had been placed where they shouldn't have been placed and got stuck there, if you know what I mean. So um, it was a crazy start, uh, but it was a great learning experience, um, and it really taught me uh, how to work with people, how to talk with people, especially in uh, uncomfortable or unusual uh, situations. Now, we also had an in-house creative agency for PR and marketing, um, as well as our external ad agencies that we worked with at the time, and that was uh, LMG, Lauer Marketing Group. I'm sure a few of you still uh, remember that group, uh, as well as Cooper Smith Advertising. So I, I was fortunate enough to work with just a really, really great group of people from all different disciplines, from uh, brand strategists, researchers, copywriters, videographers. It was, it was a tremendous learning experience. Uh, 
as I moved up through the ranks there at uh, ProMedica, I ended up uh, directing the advertising for the healthcare system. So I got to work on some pretty amazing campaigns throughout the years. Uh, one, I was I was fortunate enough to meet the legendary uh, Hank Aaron, for all you baseball fans out there. Uh, he taped a uh, spot for us for our children's hospital. So that was pretty cool. Um, I also uh, was fortunate enough to work on a really significant project, although at the time I did not realize the importance of it, and that was being on the team that created the original brand for ProMedica Health System. So we created the name, the brand architecture, and yes, the color green. <laughs> so apologies for that. Um, but um, it was a tremendous experience, and there's a few of us out there, uh, as I look, look at the power of that brand, um, there's a few of us out there that work together together to uh, create that. So that was that was a proud moment. Uh, from there, um, I got a call to join Image Source, which uh, was the largest production house in, in about the tri-state uh, area. They had clients like General Motors, Hewlett Packard, um, all the big corporations. So I jumped over and started doing account work, which was a really, really huge shift for me. Um, at that time, uh, the industry was going through a big shift too. Bill was talking about, uh, you know, us old people talking. So this was back in the mid nineties <laughs> and uh, this thing called the internet and websites were just uh, starting to surface. So because of our roots in technology, uh, we were able to very quickly adapt and start producing websites. And there was a huge demand for them at that time. Uh, we could not, crank them out fast enough. So our staff grew almost overnight to 130 people, which was absolutely crazy. Um, and we still couldn't keep up. Uh, so just as we had firmly planted our feet in this new digital landscape, uh, the scare of Y2K came along, you know, the onset of the year 2000 and literally the entire world um, thought it was going to come to an end. So thankfully it didn't, but that was a little nerve wracking. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the country took another really devastating hit shortly thereafter with the attack of 9-11 and everything just came to a halt. I mean, it just stopped. Business plummeted. Um, everyone was devastated. Um, and as quickly as we had grown, uh, we had to uh, downsize. And within just a couple of short weeks, we had to uh, lay off over 100 people. So um, it was a horrible time. It was a horrible time for our country, for our company, um, but we all, you know, recovered. Uh, we made it through. Technology continued to evolve at a really rapid pace, uh, which meant that our once unique and high-end tech services were now becoming commonplace. Uh, the agencies that we served uh, no longer needed our services because they were bringing them in-house. Uh, so we knew we had to reinvent ourselves. So it was at that time that we uh, uh, created Thread Marketing Group. Uh, we knew we had to become a full service marketing communications agency in order to survive. So uh, we changed our staff makeup, uh, changed the services and started attracting clients um, at a national level, clients like Steelcase Furniture, which was really cool. They have an incredible uh, design team, very innovative design team. Um, so it was interesting to work with, with uh, teams like that uh, here locally. Uh, picked up clients like Lord's University, uh, which was probably one of my all-time favorite campaigns to work on um, because we helped them transition from a college status to a university status with the Discover a New View campaign. Um, as a matter of fact, my, my good buddy Mark Ryder uh, worked as the audio engineer on that campaign with me. I don't know if you remember that, Mark. Uh, we worked on a lot of campaigns together. Um, so that was fun. And also another interesting tidbit was at the time we didn't have videographers on staff. So I also called up my good buddy, Bill Sattler, to help me on that campaign. And he gave me a big fat no. <laughs> Do you remember that, Bill? <laughs> It was it was for good reason though. I eventually forgave him. I, I, uh, yeah. I rarely say no, but it was probably a conflict. It was a conflict. Yes, he had. You made reasons. him blush, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, truth hurts sometimes. Uh, so no, so um, so that was a really really great campaign. Um, and then you know we we continued to grow and expand. Um. 
we did take another pretty big hit with the recession of 2008. You know, again, business just dropped off. Our, our largest client at that time was General Motors. We were into them for almost a quarter million dollars and they filed for bankruptcy protection. <laughs> So um, I was I was pretty convinced that that was the end of of our company. You know that was curtains for us. But um, you know through a lot of prayer, a lot of perseverance, um, some really good partners, um, we we made it through that time. And a few short years later, we actually expanded. Uh, we started to partner with and uh, work with the FLS group. We ultimately ended up purchasing them, Mark Lukey and BJ and and their team to uh, help us round out our uh, public relations and event-based marketing. So uh, we've just grown since then. Uh, as you said at the beginning, we work with clients like Henry Ford, uh, McLaren St. Luke's. That was another great campaign to work on uh, when St. Luke's was forced, uh, well, when ProMedica was forced to divest St. Luke's from, from their brand, uh, we were called on to help them reposition themselves in the market to uh, instill consumer confidence back into that into that hospital. So we created the One Hospital Stands Apart campaign. And, and that was, again, another really interesting campaign to work on because it wasn't just your typical campaign. Uh, we, we got to work with uh, healthcare strat, <clears throat> excuse me, healthcare strat strategists at a national level um, who were helping them to to redefine themselves and reposition themselves in the market. So, so it was really great. And, and uh, you know, as you said, we helped Toledo Clinic rebrand. Re um, we work with a lot of nonprofits because our, our focus is really helping to build up and shore up our community. Um, and of course our signature client and event Toledo Jeep Fest. So it's been it's been a long ride, an interesting one. I never uh, thought through that whole story that I would see a year like 2020, um, but <laughs> we all made it through that as well. And I guess that's what keeps it interesting. Indeed, it does. What a, a fascinating career path you've had, Judy. Um, I have a feeling our audience might want to uh, dig a little bit deeper into that once we get into the Q and A. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you just even asking me in here. It's uh, it's awesome it's to uh, just be with these, uh, you know, on the panel with these two people, as Judy said, and so nicely. They're good friends. And again, just great people to be with. But uh, for me, uh, you know, my journey is uh, kind of a lot like Bill's after uh, um, flunking out of um, accounting twice in college, I decided if I wanted a degree that I should probably find something that I enjoyed doing. So I, I was at Bowling Green also, but uh, and fanning through the, uh, the book of, of majors and stuff, I found broadcasting and the uh, radio, television, and film uh, direction, which, uh, you know, really, it, it, I, I was able to do it without it you know, uh, to study that kind of stuff without it making me sick, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> doing accounting did. So I was able to kind of work my way through there and actually get some decent grades. Um, when it came to be about my senior year, I uh, was looking for an internship. I went out on a shoot with uh, Bill Clark Communications. So my dad knew him and uh, Mike Malone was the camera cameraman at that time. And I just slept gear for Mike. And at the end, I told them that I was looking for an internship. They both turned me down at the time because they were both one-man shops and uh, didn't really accept interns. So I kind of went back to school and was looking at the, you know, WBGU. I was actually training to and uh, work at a TV station and uh, probably would have gotten an internship there. Although, unbeknownst to me, Mike Malone had given my name to a recording studio here in Toledo, it was called Audiocom. Uh, they were looking for somebody to duplicate cassettes. <laughs> a thing, uh, that was a thing again way back when as we talk about a lot of old stuff. Um, but uh, I asked them, the first question I asked them was, you know, well, what, what kind of music do you record? And they, they said, well, we don't record music. And I said, <laughs> I didn't even know uh, such a thing existed. Uh, 
you know, a recording studio that just didn't record music, music, you know, they find out they did voiceovers and soundtracks and, and, um, you know, other things in the process other than recording uh, bands. So it was a neat thing to get to, to know and understand. So I ended up accepting that because I didn't really have any other uh, offers on the table. Uh, stayed there as a cassette duplicator for a while, but I got to be buddies with the uh, engineer that was there. I started uh, learning some of the talent, uh, getting to know some of the voice talents uh, in the area. Um, started running some sessions and anyway, it, it progressed to where he, this guy decided to leave. So I was lucky enough to be able to be hired um, into his spot. And I ended up basically staying there for 17 years and um, working, just developing the craft and, and getting better at, at what I was doing. Uh, when the owner of Audiocom and I decided to part ways, that was in 2004. And that's when I started um, Level 2 Audio. And, uh, and now, oddly enough, that's gonna be about, I'm working on my 17th year now here in December, that'll be my 17th year. So kind of 17 years there. I, I almost hate to admit it sometimes being in business for over, uh, you know, sometimes when you say it over 20 years sounds good, especially to younger people, that sounds cool. You got, you, you got uh, experience, but when you're over, you know, 30 years, you, you could be a little old, you know, uh, maybe uh, not, not with the time. So still trying to uh, keep up with that stuff. But, um, you know, just to kind of go over, I find that because I'm on the vendor side of it, uh, and again, Judy and Bill are both clients of mine, and and uh, as well as some other people, I get the chance to uh, experience a lot of different things. And some of the fun things that I wrote down anyway that I've been able to do over the years. Uh, one one project that stuck out was another project in the '90s, and oddly enough, Judy, uh, this was for uh, Prometica Health System through LMG. We did a uh, one of the first ISDN sessions, which an ISDN session uh, allowed us to hook up with different studios. So we we sat here in Toledo, hooked up with an LA studio to record Burgess Meredith. Uh, I don't know if anybody remembers Burgess Meredith. He was Rocky's coach, uh, you know, in all the movies and stuff. But just a, a great uh, human being and just the nicest man you'd ever want to want to talk with. But anyway, that was a big deal because as we talked about, the internet wasn't quite going yet. So that was really cool. I think Stu mentioned, I guess, you know, we were, through another client, we were able to fly down to Miami and interview LeBron James, which is pretty neat. And I was, uh, since I was the audio guy, I got to mic him up. I got to talk to him a little bit and, uh, you know, just kind of get a little bit more personal <laughs> than anybody else. Um, flying down to NASA, uh, NASA, not NASA, NASA. And interviewing Gene Krantz was really a cool project for me because uh, uh, I didn't know it at the time. He was a Toledo native, but Gene Krantz was the flight director for just so many of the famous uh, Apollo flights uh, throughout uh, history. And, and through the more famous ones, the moon landing, he was the flight director on Apollo 11. And then he was also the flight director during Apollo 13 and they even highlighted him in the movie. But it was great just hearing his story and sitting in, in NASA and in the control room and stuff. It was really, really a neat experience. Did a lot of work back in the day with Katie Holmes uh, when she first got started in uh, her acting career. She used to come in and do ADR, which is uh, dialogue replacement. So she would come in and record lines that they didn't get on locations for uh, Dawson's Creek when she was doing that. And uh, we worked on uh, a movie called The Ice Storm. Uh, I actually uh, did another one with her too, called when she did The President's Daughter. So that was just, again, different stuff, a lot of fun. Um, I'd say one of my favorite product projects was a definitely a madhouse project. It was they had they produced the uh, walleye opener a few years back. Well, they've done it a few years now, but the one that stands out, uh, I think, uh, just I don't know. Maybe some of these people have seen it and this stuff, but it's it just uh, so creative, so out there. They offered me uh, a lot of creative license in the thing to. Uh, to add stuff and hopefully make it a little bit better and and raise you know raise it up, add something to the job and it was just just a really cool one. 
uh, that, that stands out for me. Um, just to share a, uh, uh, one of the worst projects I've ever done <laughs> um, was I had a client that did a promotional uh, video for St. John's where they, we scheduled out a whole day for people to come into the studio and record uh, lines and, and interviews and stuff. Administrators, students, um, teachers, parents, uh, at, at least 25 different people. And it was back in the day when we were just getting started in computers. So there wasn't a lot of uh, storage room on the computer. So I decided to use a, what we call a digital audio tape, which is basically just like a cassette, but it's uh, digital. And uh, offered me about two hours of recording time when I didn't have to worry about other things going on. And so people came in, did the whole session, laid everything down. So I thought, uh, <laughs> Um, got done with the session, you know, about eight hours, uh, rewound to check it, and there was nothing on the tape. I still, to this day, I have no idea why there was nothing on the tape, but at that point, you break out in a cold sweat, right? And, and you go, okay, how am I going to sit down and tell the client that, that, you know, we have to somehow get 25 people that took the day off and were, got out of school and have them all come back in. Well, anyway, we worked it out somehow and I did the rest of the job for free, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's just how it goes. And, uh, but we got the job done. But I have found just for anybody out there, unfortunately, this kind of thing, and Bill attests to it, and I'm sure Judy has done it too, but uh, this kind of stuff happens to everybody. Everybody has this story, this kind of a crazy story where bad things have gone on. But, uh, you know, that's okay. That's okay. Um, we showed up. Mark, we showed up at a shoot without our camera once. <laughs> well, well, my other one, there's another one when I showed up, I, actually for a, a location with you guys, and I showed up and I didn't have my microphone. <laughs> I had taken it out to, uh, to record something else and forgot to put it in my location bag, so. I think anyway. that happened on one of the uh, projects you worked on with me too, Mark. No, no, I never made a mistake with your project. <laughs> it was always Bill's stuff. <laughs> But my creative process is, uh, you know, I, I find creative um, inspiration from my clients. They come in with a creative idea. My job is to get on board with that idea and hopefully add something to it, at least allow them to uh, envision their idea and, and hopefully even make it a little bit better. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at for now. So Sue, whatever you want to do now, it's up to you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mark. Um, well, great, great stories. Uh, and I can attest to um, kind of this theme we've heard about um, the wandering student, if you will, right? So we're trying to find our niche. We're trying to find our passion. Um, my undergrad was in uh, environmental health, and I, you know, started my professional career right out of college and found out very quickly I just it was missing something. Um, so I went back and got an MBA, and that's where I discovered my passion for marketing marketing and kind of have been fortunate enough to combine both uh, the marketing aspect and the environmental aspect into a career um, that I love. I love getting up and going to work every day. So um, we've got a lot of uh, students within AAF membership. We've got a lot here um, on our webinar today. And this is open to, to all our panelists. What advice do you have for students who are just starting to think about the career path they'd like to take? <laughs> you know, um, what advice do you have for them? I can jump in on that. Uh, you know, one of the things uh, I tell students when I talk to them a lot, you know, we do uh, guest presentations at BG and UT. And uh, one of the things I always tell them is really take the time to find out what your strengths are. Um, you know, people often talk about your weaknesses, what you can't do, but um, there are a lot of tools out there, online tools, um, where you can do testing to find out what your strengths are. And if you capitalize on that and um, do what, what innately comes naturally, um, you're going to succeed. You know, if you're always fighting, you know, Mark talked about it, Bill talked about it a little bit, you know, we tried different things. We tried accounting, we tried whatever, um, but that wasn't innate to who we are. 
Um, so, so we weren't successful at that. So if you really discover that early on and then find a career path that matches up with those strengths um, and, and you're just gonna naturally succeed and you'll be a whole lot happier. <laughs> I just jump on the tail end of that and just say, um, you know, I got pretty lucky uh, with finding graphic design when I got to school and I didn't change majors after that. I was, I was set, but um, I, I talked to a, a lot of young people. And I think the one thing that, that I would say is don't get uh, overwhelmed with your first job out of school. Um, I would say jump into something, take an opportunity, get some experience um, you know, don't be afraid to take something that maybe doesn't seem perfect, uh, cause nothing's ever perfect. And, and it's really where you're going to start learning. So, uh, yeah, I've just talked to some young people and, and had, you know, they had big plans for their first, first gig right out of school. And I, I think that's setting some pretty big expectations, uh, when you really need some experience. Yeah, for, my, for me, it's uh, basically just piggybacking on that, but I always give the advice to um, do something that you love. I have too many friends that, that went out and got talked into doing um, things that they weren't really into, uh, maybe for money, uh, uh, mostly probably for money. But and then ended up hating every, uh, every moment of their life and regretting that they didn't do something that they you know really wanted to do i sit down here i'm blessed enough uh that even when i sit down and do something as menial as just edit a voiceover or something like that i still get fired up and i still enjoy doing that kind of thing uh you know the old adage of you know i never worked a day in my life i guess maybe that applies maybe not but uh you know just do something that you really enjoy and again by doing what the other two have <laughs> suggested, I think you could probably do that, taking that advice. It's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so for our audience, if you have a question you'd like to ask, um, go ahead and uh, put it in the chat box and uh, I'll keep my eye on that. Um, not sure we'll be able to unmute everybody's mic. So let's uh, go ahead and use the chat box for the Q&A. Um, and in the meantime, I'll keep it rolling. Um, so all three of our panelists are business owners. Um, talk to us a little bit. Um, we can go in two directions. Tell us a little bit either about your ideal client or taking the opposite approach. Like what happens when you've got the, the opposite of your ideal client and how do you manage that situation? Oh man, should I jump in on this one? Please do. How much time do I have? <laughs> Um, ideal client, that's easy. That's, that's someone who, um, who learns to trust us and who comes in with an open mind. Um, ultimately somebody that, that has an idea about how this whole marketing advertising design process works. That's always a, a really good start. Um, but someone who has an open mind and trusts us uh, usually those projects are, are winners all the time. Um, and, and I'm talking large or small, it doesn't matter. We like, we like all sizes of clients. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to us. Um, challenging, uh, challenging clients are, uh, I guess just the exact opposite of that. People that don't trust us, that, that kind of treat us like vendors, not, really as partners or people that are there to, you know, work with them. Um, that, that relationship is pretty transactional at that point. And it's, it's like, let's get this job done for someone where when you we have a relationship with someone, you're really, you, you bought into to their strategy and what they want to accomplish. And you're, you're helping them on an ongoing basis. I think what we do, what we try to do, not always successful, but we feel like when, when somebody hires us, they hired us to do a job. And if that, if they push back on that, and that includes us having to have some difficult conversations of, around, um, you know, you hired us to do this, you're not letting us do this, you know, we need to push you in this direction. Sometimes those are hard discussions, but if we're going to do our job right, we have to have those discussions. We have to 
uh, we have to push back on on some stuff. We can't just uh, you know do whatever. It doesn't it doesn't really work out really well if that if that's the case. I'd have to say the, uh, the thing uh, that I would say in response to that is another thing that I tell uh, students also, and that's uh, something that I learned. I worked at a, a, as a teller um, when I was in college, so I got to deal with the public and customer service and stuff like that right at the beginning, and I learned how to, one, be professional at, no matter what the circumstance, and the, other, the second one was to deal with negativity. I had dealt with a lot of problems. A lot of people coming in with, you know, didn't know, uh, were mad at the bank or whatever, mad at what was going on, had a problem. And I had to learn and, and get with them and work it out so I could solve their problems. So if you, if you care about the, the people that you're working with, you solve their problems. Uh, I think that's, uh, you can't, and, and care about solving their problems. It's one of the best things you can do. And you'll always be wanted uh, when you do that. Um, you know, the people will come back to you then because you can solve their problems. It's a big deal. All right, we've got some questions rolling in from our audience. Um, the first one, I am an undergrad senior graphic design student at BGSU. Go Falcons. Um, I had a question for Bill. You talked about impatience for yourself in design. How do you help combat that when you need to take things slow or have a slower process to follow? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I, luckily, I work with a team of talented professionals um, that, that all have different processes that, that, um, that uh, I can take credit for and, <laughs> and I can work with and use, use what they're coming like they're sketching they're they're creating mood boards they're doing research they're so that it's pretty easy for me i think if i was on my own i would use uh my impatience as as a tool uh sometimes if i jump right in and i start making things uh i'm not going to stop doing that but maybe i'll do iterations of those things and that's my process of refining uh a design so um you know, I'm at, at, at my age, I realize that I'm really not going to change the way I, uh, the way I go through a design process, but I can, I can refine and get better at it, if that makes sense. Uh, and being with a group is, is uh, very beneficial to me. Right. It's so helpful to, to be in a room. And that's really what so many people are struggling with now is we're unable to be in a room together to feed off that creative energy and, and you know, find inspiration, big or small. Uh, I know it's impacted my marketing team tremendously. Mm -hmm. um, Judy, the next question is for you. Uh, you mentioned loving and having a passion for animals. Have you ever worked or wanted to work on a project that involved this subject? Also, I'm currently working on a doggy daycare and I definitely understand the hard work involved. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yes, I, I have and I'm, I'm constantly on the lookout, uh, you know, to work with an organization uh, that, that needs marketing support. Uh, one of the ways that I've uh, satisfied that passion of mine is to volunteer my time working uh, with the boards of animal organizations. So um, I was on the board of the Humane Society here locally uh, for 12 years. I served on that board and helped them with their marketing initiatives. And I'm currently on the board of Humane Ohio, um, helping them not only with board issues, organizational issues, but also with marketing direction. So. So even if you can't find a client, uh, you know, that matches up with your interests, um, there's always ways to volunteer and, and still provide these organizations, especially these nonprofit organizations who don't have the budgets and really need help. Um, so it's a win-win. So that's how I do it. Thank you. Uh, the next question is open for all of our panelists. Um, what triggered you to go into business for yourself? Is it a certain situation or a breakdown of a relationship or need for growth? Mark, you start. Well, I don't know. You know, 
It's hard to say. I think uh, I just found that this was something that I could do by myself. I didn't necessarily need I when I worked at AudioCon, they, they probably had, uh, you know, five or six different people. We did some different things. Um, you know, they did tape duplication and and other other little things on the side. We had like an office manager and stuff like that. I just found that that I could probably do all this on my own and, and I wanted the freedom. Uh, I had gone through many years without making a whole lot of money, to be honest with you. And, and when I saw the opportunity that this was something that I could do, I could actually, uh, you know, make some money and contribute to my family a little bit more, uh, which was great by, and, you know, by being able to do that on my own, uh, I was able to do that. My, my dad was a um, small business owner, um, ran a, a painting and wallpapering company for 40 plus years. And so I don't think I ever didn't want to be a business owner, uh, but I did know that I didn't know anything. Um, and I, I, I had no intention of just coming right out of school and being a business owner. Um, I wanted to work somewhere and, and meet creative people and and learn how it worked and you know and and then and then when when the time was right and um felt like had the experience then we you know we made the leap but it's it's a big scary ordeal i don't know if these guys can attest to that my situation um you know not running a business and starting out and everything involved healthcare taxes every you know payroll um, it's a whole different ball game, but it is pretty rewarding and uh, pretty happy that we did it. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and I think Mark would as well, Bill, that it's very scary, um, especially for probably the three of us who came out of a creative background. We did not have those business skills. Um, you had to learn them on the fly. Um, so I'm not sure it was a conscious decision <laughs> on my part, um, but it was one of, you know, taking a risk and wanting to be adventurous. And as these guys mentioned, having the freedom, I mean, there's nothing like it, um, not just owning your own business, but owning your own creative business, because it's, you know, the, the structure is unfettered. There's so much freedom. You get to meet such a variety of people, such a diverse set of people that you get to encounter. Um, it's just, it's really exciting, but it's also really scary because at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's your house that's, uh, you know, your mortgage that's on the line. You're, you know, you're responsible for all these people and their paychecks. And uh, so you have to, you have to learn quickly and you have to be strong. Um, but it's, it's worth it. Definitely. Uh, another question from our audience. Do you have any advice for students graduating in May amidst a pandemic and other challenges? Good question. Um, you know, I, I, I suppose uh, the pandemic does add a layer of, of difficulty to it, but at the same time, not really. I mean, you know, you have to go out there um, you know, realize that you're going to have to try things, you know, um, take an internship, uh, take a job for no pay, low pay, you know, volunteer. Um, you can still do that remotely, still do it virtually. Um, and just just put yourself out there. You know, you, you have to establish your own personal brand and network and be visible. Yeah, I was I was on a panel um, couple months ago and this question came up over and over uh, I agree I, I don't I think that especially our our business our industry I, I don't want to speak for Judy and Mark but you know we've gotten pretty used to this right now I mean it's still weird but we've gotten we've gotten pretty good at this remote uh, this remote thing and these virtual meetings and I don't really know if there's much excuse at this point I think our industry, from whom I've talked with, we've been pretty fortunate um, to, to stay busy. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of businesses aren't doing well. I think from, from my friends in the industry, we all feel pretty lucky that we're, we're doing pretty good. So, uh, you know, 
I think the opportunity is there. I think it's a different format and uh, a, just a different approach, but the same thing applies. I think you still have to, you have to stay on top of it. You have to be professional. You have to, uh, you know, you have to respond. I mean, it's, you know, handwritten notes mailed to people that still works, um, you know, no typos, uh, good portfolio, uh, all that stuff still applies. So um, I think you're, you're lucky that you're in this field and, and not some others right now. That's what I would say. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, just realize that, you know, if you get told no, that doesn't mean you're not qualified or you're not talented. It just means, you know, the situation isn't right, um, you know, today. Maybe it will be in three months or six months. Um, so don't give up. Don't get frustrated. Um, you know, you're, you're going to have a lot of doors slammed. You're going to take a lot of no's. Um, especially early on, but, you know, just keep at it, um, you know, get all the negativity out of your head and just, you know, be open, open to new opportunities, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. That's Mark, great. any closing words of wisdom before we wrap things up? Well, this is, that's great advice. And uh, just from a personal standpoint, my son is graduating in, in the summer from BG. We just had this uh, this same conversation just just last week. We sat down around the table and we're telling him, "Hey, uh, you know, because he didn't have a chance to go out and last year and and get the uh, internship or whatever, or look for a job, you know, with everything closed down." So the the thing is, is just to again what they were saying, along with some of the simple stuff, like Bill said, is the most important stuff. The, the easy things to do, the things you don't even have to have a talent at, just to do all those good things, but just to do it, especially as far as uh, networking and stuff like that. You saw probably what happened with each one of us getting to know somebody. We might have uh, had a relationship that turned into a, a job opportunity, blah, blah, blah. But the more you get those relationships built and out there, the more chance you're going to have of doing something that you really enjoy. Absolutely. Join organizations, definitely. Get involved with organizations and networking opportunities, even outside of the industry, because you'll meet different people. Great words of, of wisdom, for sure, from um, titans in our industry. You know, we're talking decades, right? 30, 60, yeah. 80 years amongst all of you. <laughs> At least. Thanks, so. Thanks, so. Appreciate that. <laughs> Mark, did you say that you were a cassette duplicator? I don't know if anybody knows what a cassette is. Uh, yes. Um, I had a picture I'd let you see. <laughs> we're going to wrap things up here. And first, I want to sincerely thank our panelists, Judy and Mark and Bill, um, for taking time out. I, I know your schedules are busy. So thank you for the preparation you put into today's discussion and, and being candid uh, with our audience. We, we do appreciate it. And um, thanks to everyone out there our, to our audience uh, for joining us today. I mean, you're the reason why we're here. So um, please stay engaged and enjoy our programming. I do wanna take a moment um, to recognize our board of governors and all of the committee members with AAF Toledo for demonstrating demonstrating great resiliency over the past year. You know, we've all been hit with a ton of challenges, um, but these folks are, these are volunteer roles uh, with AAF in addition to their professional roles, whether they're educators or students, um, marketers, business owners, um, and many more capacities. So you've got your professional roles, you're dedicated to volunteering, many of you have families and passions to pursue with the challenge of balancing all of this and you throw in the global pandemic, you know, they've managed to bring incredible programming to over 100 AAF members. So a huge thank you um, for all of the time that you put into this organization. If you are from the Toledo area and you're not an AAF member, please consider joining. Jump on aaftoledo.org. Um, it is super easy. It's very affordable. And just one of the benefits is incredible programming uh, like we've had today. I feel like I'm doing an NPR commercial here. <laughs> 
Um, if you're not a member, join us. If you're not from the Toledo area, you can check out um, AAF, uh, the national organization. There are local chapters across the country, um, so it should be easy for you to find um, your local network. And uh, if you are already a member, please take a moment to engage in the organization. You heard our panelists talk about the importance of networking um, for starting a career or continuing a career. Um, it, please get engaged. You can find us on social. We're on Facebook, LinkedIn, Insta, Twitter. Um, start a conversation. Uh, recommend a speaker or a topic or volunteer to speak yourself. Um, just take advantage of this incredible um, brain trust that we have in, in the creativity that surrounds us. Um, so with that, we we do have some program coming up shortly here. Um, Coffee with Creatives, this is a brand new series we started this year. Um, it happens the second Thursday of every month. We did take January off, so our next session is February 11th. And that will be a live discussion with creative experts, um, Jordan Bush. He's an associate producer with Netflix and content creator and entrepreneur, Will Lucas. So that's going to be a, a great discussion. Uh, February Lunch and Learn will be on the 17th of February. Uh, the title is Mixing Business with Pleasure to Build an Audience. Um, this is uh, presented to you by Promo Hits and registration is limited. Um, our registration deadline is February 9th and we're taking the first 30 registrants. Um, so don't wait. And then finally, CareerCon, uh, February 25th to the 27th. This is a virtual event for students seeking internships and young professionals looking to break into the world of marketing, advertising, journalism, or media. Uh, you'll hear from current local professionals, a lot like today, um, that span each of those industries. Uh, during two days of live panel sessions, you'll be able to participate in a portfolio review or an interview to put your acquired knowledge and skills to practice. Um, information and registration on all of those is available on our website, aaftoledo.org on the events page. Um, so with that, we're going to close out today. Thank you again, everybody. I think it was a great session.